Her Story is a program that explores women, leadership, and healthcare. Welcome to Her Leadership Story. My name is Joanne Conroy, and I'm President and CEO of Dartmouth Hitchcock and Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And it is my great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Terry Fulmer, PhD, RN, who's president of the John A. Hartford Foundation and a member of Women of Impact. And we are here to talk about um, a little bit about her life story, as well as some of her um, perspectives on where we need to go in terms of aging in America. So welcome, Terry. It's great to have you here. Joanne, thank you so much. I'm just honored to be with you today. So let's start a little bit with how your career in nursing actually started. How did you determine your direction? I'm going to call myself one of the lucky ones because from the time I was five years old, I knew I was going to be a nurse. I was inspired by my mother, who was a cadet nurse, and she had these incredible capes when she was in the army and she seemed to ha she seemed to be so knowledgeable she knew things she inspired me her twin sister was a nurse several of my aunts were nurses my sister's a nurse my nieces are nurses there is a temperament that goes with that and i have always been so um, blessed to say that i picked the right profession there were probably some decision trees somewhere in your career, yeah. though, um, where you moved from bedside nursing to actually nursing leadership and nursing research. And I will tell you that I continue to do my bedside nursing as an attending nurse at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City, where I go on service twice a year to ground myself in the essence of the profession. As I began my career at the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, one of the great moments was when I determined that I was going to be working for the one and only Joyce Clifford. Joyce Clifford was an iconic nurse leader who inspired all of us to be primary nurses, to own our practice, to be responsible and accountable for our practice. Trish Gibbons was the chief, the chief of medical nursing, a woman who stayed in my life uh, until she died too early at 70 of cancer. But Trish was a person who always just gave you a platform to run with it and would say to you, Terry, you care about improving the well-being and care of older adults. What do you want to do here? That's how we started Niche. Terry, you are very worried about elder abuse. What do you want to do? Go ahead and start the Beth Israel elder abuse team. And we did. And so it's about leadership and it's about women empowering women. When you were at Beth Israel, um, your paths crossed with a young physician that was an author that wrote a book that was um, very popular when I was going to medical school. And I understand sure. they still sell between one and two million copies a year. So the context, the 70s, women's liberation movement, unrest on campuses, uh, black power, all these things going on, and uh, a, a general upheaval about medical education, by the way, as well as nursing education. And Samuel Shem had written a book called House of God. I read the book and I was never more offended in my life. And it's probably one of the reasons I became so passionate about geriatrics. There was a, a, a riff in that book that talked about uh, frail older adults. They talked about tying bows in people's hair, making fun of them. And I was disgusted and it set my path. If you don't want to give good care to older people, get away from them and yeah. don't do it. Experiences like that galvanize people. And um, it obviously galvanized you to go into geriatric care. Um, talk a little bit about your path to the Hartford Foundation, which arguably is an organization in the U.S. that's doing the most to really advance care of the elderly, area of medicine that's rife with opportunities to really change things. It really is. I was at the Beth Israel. I saw that we could improve care for the geriatric patients. And it turned out that there was a person named Jack Rowe who was coming back from the National Institute on Aging and setting up the Division on Aging and the the Department of Geriatrics at the Beth Israel. And I saw the opening. I knew that he would need an interdisciplinary team and nurses. 
we began working together and every time there was an opportunity within that constellation of experts we had just extraordinary faculty uh, in the Harvard Division on Aging, and I just stepped up and said yes, because there was always something that would advance my career, be interesting, and would help me improve care for older adults. So why do I say that in this context? When I was at the Division on Aging, the John A. Hartford Foundation trustees came to visit to do a site visit, and I was there and watched as the foundation talked about funding work on delirium very early on. Uh, I was recruited next as my husband got a job opportunity in New York City. We moved to a town called Rye, New York. I got there and was recruited to Yale. And uh, when I got there, again, there was the Johnny Hartford Foundation talking with Leo Cooney, the endowed chair and, direct and chairman of geriatrics at Yale. And I watched and listened and already had a little sense of the foundation and they launched something called hope the hope project hospital outcomes for patients who are elderly and i was able to embed my thinking that i had begun to um, evolve around the niche program at the beth israel and embed it into that work at hope and at yale and the john a hartford foundation funded that work again i got to know them a little bit better and embed them and subsequently, uh, after a wonderful uh, period of time at Yale, I was recruited to Columbia. And uh, when I got there, uh, the, uh, I continued my conversations with the foundation and they made, me, made the first grant ever to a nurse to me at Columbia, along with my co-PI, Maddie Mezzi at NYU. And that's where we really uh, began in earnest uh, the, the full-fledged development of niche nurses improving care of our health systems elderly so from there moving from columbia got recruited to nyu and there maddie and i led the john a hartford the hartford institute for geriatric nursing i got recruited to northeastern university in boston which was a, just a, a, another one of those fairy tale places where it was uh, up and coming scrappy and restless moving very beautifully into the forefront of higher education. There I was at Northeastern, and I got a phone call from the, the uh, search firm who was looking for a new, new CEO for the John A. Hartford Foundation. And to my great delight, I was successfully selected, and I've been there for now going into my sixth year. I know that one of your favorite quotes is a quote from Gloria Steinem that says, without leaps of imagination or dreaming, we lose the excitement of possibilities. Did you dream you were going to be a college president and then had to kind of shift it to be president of, you know, a national foundation? So what, what I know about me is I love to beat my personal best. I am not competing with you. I'm competing with me. And when I move my career ahead, I like to beat my personal best and say to myself, I could do that. Very often you're looking at people in roles and you say, I could do that. So if you could, then do it. You know, it's the talk, talk is cheap, watch what people do. And so if you think you can do it, try. I might submit 10 papers before one gets accepted. I might put my name in for three jobs before I get that next one. And to share the moments of failure and if you want to call it that i don't call it failure i just call it next round just talk a little bit about you know your first 100 days at the harvard foundation i mean you were a known entity they knew you but it's different <laughs> to be known by an organization and to come in and you know really make an assessment of how you actually make that organization better it's all about understanding the trustees mission, vision, and goals, what they want, and making sure you mesh with them and that you, you mesh with them. You don't compromise what you think is right, but you listen carefully. When I joined the foundation, uh, they, they were in transition with uh, chairs. We had been uh, very devoted to developing the next generation of leaders in geriatrics. So we had, were funding centers in geriatric medicine, geriatric nursing, geriatric social work, and funding models of care, as well as doing our health, health and aging policy fellows program. When I joined, they said that they wanted to shift downstream to the po point of practice 
music to my ears. You know, I was in higher education as a dean or a professor for 37 years, loved every minute of it. But at my heart, I'm a clinician. And so, and in my essence, I'm a clinician. And so um, I could translate that for them. And I knew I was going to be able to do that. First hundred days. When I took the position, I presented my first hundred days and they were very pleased with that. But I got there in May and by June, I needed to lead my first trustee meeting we meet quarterly. By September, one of our trustees said, so Terry, what's your big idea? And I kind of knew, and I said, you know, my big idea is age-friendly health systems, because there is no such thing. And we moved very rapidly from there. And what I needed to do was work with our remarkable staff at the foundation, who are very smart and very uh, knowledgeable, and say to them, this is what I'm thinking. Are you with me? Can you improve it with me? Can you get on board with me? And I looked in the eyes of each of them and they have been my most passionate supporters. When you talk about age-friendly health systems, um, especially around COVID, we mm -hmm. have, a, have seen a lot of gaps. How has that shifted your thinking about age-friendly health systems and maybe the priorities that we need to um, address? What I would say is for all of us in geriatrics, it was a galvanizing moment. It's like, oh my goodness, all of a sudden we were seeing the numbers out of nursing homes. We made an emergency grant to the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to work on a national nursing home huddle that took place every day from 12 to 1220 to really get out there and support the frontline nursing home uh, personnel as well as anybody else who wanted to join us. Yeah. You know, I think for all Americans that have family members in nursing homes and haven't been able to see them, but have been able to appreciate the impact of the isolation, as well as um, some of the strains on our nursing home system right now um, in order to deliver the care that we would expect to receive as an older person. So think 10 years ahead or 20 years ahead, and what do you hope um, elder care will look like in the frail elderly. What you're describing, Joanne, is an age-friendly health system, a system that starts at your kitchen table, takes you perhaps to the emergency room, maybe to the ICU, back to rehab, back to your kitchen table. Every point of care has to be age-friendly. So no matter where you are, point of care, quality of care, an age-friendly health system causes no harm, is, is responsive to what matters to the older individual and is reliable. What we have is a lack of reliability that is shocking to you and to me, uh, and it can't continue. When I try to get people's attention on this, and I am very serious about it, I say, let's close all nursing homes. Why would we do that? Because incremental, tedious little tinkering and change will not do what we need to have ready for the baby boomers. Right, who will be out in force looking for some support um, as they age. Let's talk about you personally. So sure. when you were talking about your journey, you've actually moved to a bunch of different cities and um, you have a professional spouse. Mm -hmm. How did you and your husband actually manage that? So that's a negotiation that's ongoing from the time you, dis you, you decide that you're a couple. Um, and Keith and I met actually in third grade and we started dating when I was 15. And so we've known each other. And one of the beauties of that is I knew his mom and dad. He knew my mom. My dad had since passed. But he, we knew a lot about each other. And we sort of had a, a, a way of understanding each other, which does not mean that our negotiations were any easier. Um, we we uh, graduated college. And there was a first negotiation where um, Keith got a scholarship to St. Lawrence. I got a scholarship to Skidmore. These were incredible schools, very generous scholarships, or we wouldn't have gone. Mm -hmm. uh, he um, got uh, a an, an position in grad school at Northeastern, so that decided Boston. So each way along, each turn along the way, it's like, where are we going to live? How are we going to do this? Um, we were married several years before we had our first adorable baby, Nina, who's now 36. <laughs> And at that moment, Keith turned to me and he said, you're not really going to work, are you? And I said, Keith, I'm a tenured professor. I tend to think of this as a career, even your own husband. Yeah. And in my community, in my community, people would say to me, do you have to work? It's a career. And so you will 
Um, I th think that we are not past that curve yet. Young, young women tell me it's still there. And we have to support them and help them with language. You and I both know um, that healthcare has been historically very hierarchical, very male dominated, and um, it's kind of permeated every kind of aspect of delivering care. And mm -hmm. um, I think we're breaking barriers subtly, um, but there's a lot more work to do. So talk a little bit yeah. about um, some of the interesting observations you had as a nurse leader. I mentioned briefly that I worked at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. One would notice that those are pretty traditional male dominated, particularly if you're in a medical school, organizations. So whenever I came to any table, any meeting, any discussion, extremely well prepared with science in my back pocket, with a, the clear message that I was ready to lead and take on any responsibility to get, get the work done that we needed to move ahead. And that was very helpful in terms of having me be taking, uh, being brought in as a, as a colleague and as a trusted um, partner in the work we were trying to accomplish. I think the Harvard Division on Aging was actually very um, uh, well-rounded because again, it was the 70s and there was a lot of momentum around women's rights and, and we spoke about it. And, and I, one time we were in a meeting and I remember there was a person who was talking about caregiving and one of the people in the room made the comment, well, you know, we really have to help women with caregiving. And I said, I don't want you to help me. I want you to do it. I could double the number of caregivers tomorrow if I could double the gender. And what happened in that moment is everybody laughed and they changed the topic. Fast forward, if I say the same thing today, about the same thing happens. So intent, until we seriously look at the way that we um, share those responsibilities or decide that we're going to, in any family unit, have them be unequal for reasons that we expressly understand, we won't make the progress we need. You know, it's interesting that as a medical student and even as an attending physician, I would walk into patients' rooms and they would assume I was a nurse. When female physicians are immediately considered nurses, when I was applying to colleges, there was a lot of pressure on me from my parents to go to medical school. So it was the 70s, things were opening up. Nurses, it, prior women could be secretaries, nurses, or teachers. And they felt it was in my best interest to free myself up and go for those new opportunities. And I knew I wanted to be a nurse. And so I had to argue a lot about that. And um, I would never change that, but, but it was stressful. Then as I moved up my ladder, my career ladder, people would say, oh, but you're not really a nurse. Yes, I really am a nurse. No, no, you're a PhD. I said, no, I'm not. A, I am a nurse. And then they'd say, well, why didn't you go to medical school? And what I found was helpful is I would say, you wouldn't ask a lawyer why they are not an accountant. So it's a good idea not to ask a nurse why they're not a physician. Two fundamentally different roles. And people yeah. can get that. And the other thing you have to guard against is this we versus them because people immediately riff into the well you know it's the nurses who do all the work no nurses do nursing work physicians do physician work yeah. and explain to them because that othering and that pitting is not a useful narrative talk about mentors that you've had and mentors and that you have actually sought out mm -hmm. to give you advice and you're right, it was a Camelot moment in nursing to work at the Beth Israel because everything was possible and we were empowered. We were accountable and responsible, uh, which was the key to our success. And it was really the partnership of Joyce Clifford and Mitch Rabkin, the, the CEO of Beth Israel, that made that possible. I think that there are people who are just inspiring. And so Trish Gibbons was one of those inspiring people who just, she was she would always say, always start your conversation around what's going to make it better for the patient and the conversation will go well. And that's true instead of me versus you or whose work is it or whose fault is it? What's in the best interest of this patient right now? And Trish was fun and funny and smart 
and challenging and brave. And I loved her bravery. She would cross lines sometimes that others would fall short of. Another mentor is certainly Jack Rowe. And, you know, Jack, who was, you know, <laughs> a legendary chief medical resident, then he went to NIH, and then he came back to start the you know, Division of Geriatrics and the Harvard Division on Aging. And he was tough, but fair. And he was, um, he would welcome you as long as you could hold your own. And, uh, and then he would open doors for you. And he's opened so many doors for me. Almost serving as a sponsor. Yeah, he is a sponsor. Yeah. And we all need those. So when we think about leadership, you know, this probably goes without saying our questions are, are you an accidental or a intentional leader? I am a very intentional leader. And I, I think of um, careers as almost, think of it as sport. What's your next play? And do you see the opening? And do you know where you're going to pass the ball to or where do you, you know, skate to where the puck is going and watch, because if you just keep your head up, oh my goodness, the, the, the options are remarkably broad, diverse, and deep. And then you touch base with people. You call Trish, or you call Joyce and say, what do you think of this one? Or what do you think of that? And uh, get, get some feedback. And sometimes you make mistakes and you go, I should not be here. And then you have to get out of it. <laughs> You're right. People are very willing to give advice and it can be incredibly helpful from somebody that's actually walked that path before. I'm sure um, there were a lot of people that have applied for every single job that you actually were recruited and hired for. What do you think it is about you that has allowed you to move forward? I'm very, very tenacious and uh, driven in what I consider the best sense because we only have one life and we want it to be very purposeful and we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we spent our days well and made a difference in the world. So that guides me. And uh, I think that for me, when uh, things don't go well, you take a deep breath and you have to have a sense of humor. And I have a great sense of humor and I have a great ability to laugh at myself. And I will also say, for, for me, getting from A to Z, I have a husband of 45 plus years and three unbelievable kids. And sometimes in your worst day, you come home and your kid asks you something or complains about something and it just takes every, it just puts everything in perspective. There's always somebody who has a more important question than you do. Yeah, that's great perspective. What would you tell uh, Terry who is 21 years old, given the wisdom that you have accumulated over the last 40 years? I would tell the younger Terry that it's gonna be all right, that there are multiple paths, and if you get on the wrong path, you can get off it, and that if you um, find yourself in a place where you don't believe that your capacity is doing the best for the most people, then you probably need to rethink what you're doing. And so one of the trite phrases I use, and I've used with nursing students, I'll say everything's reversible except death. So just remind yourself in these moments that, you know, we're going to get there. This is slower. This is harder. We're feeling some pain around this one, but we're going to get there and we're going to get around a corner to where we're going to be able to laugh at this. The other phrase that Trish Gibbons and I always used to say in the worst of the moments was the following. We'd say, I can't wait until this is just a bad memory. And that's helpful. <laughs> we have all done a face plant at some point in our career. We do get up and brush ourselves off and keep going. Um, you know, Terry, I have just incredible enthusiasm about the future of elder care in America and probably across the world because you're at the helm of the Hartford Foundation. So thank you so much for your time and you will inspire um, many nurses and physicians and um, people from all walks of life. Joanne, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. 